Welcome to the fourth video of the Isaacs short series, How to Become an Art Historian. Today, we are going to take our fourth step, but is what we see what we see? I proposed in the first third videos a reflection on the discipline of art history, based on the very notion of art questioning the specific issues of practicing art history on both ancient and non-Western corpuses. In the last two steps of our training together, we are going to do case studies as a way to practice in concrete terms the methodological interrogations raised in the first third videos. We have seen in the last video the importance of engaging a reflection on the physiological and cognitive phenomenon of seeing, as having an implication on our perception of images as art historians. In today's video, we are going to see what happens when we take a closer look at the images from late antiquity. We are going to question the aesthetic notion of mimesis and what that notion implies from our perception of the living representation in the images from late Antiquity. Before diving into today's subject, I would like to do a very quick reminder of what has been said about the period I am working on and the corpus I use in these videos as examples. The late antiquity in Iran corresponds to the period of the Sasanian dynasty. The Sasanian dynasty ruled over a Persian empire from 224 to 651, taking over from the Persian empire until the conquest of their own empire by the Arab Muslims. The Sasanian empire, with its capital situated at Tizifan, stretched from Armenia to Central Asia. The main religious practice within the Sasanian Empire was Zoroastrianism, and the kings proclaimed themselves Mazdian, or worshipper of Mazda, in their inscriptions, Aura Mazda being the supreme god in the Zoroastrian pantheon. In terms of visual culture, this period left us an important repertoire of images. Some of them are clearly of a royal production. That is the case with the rock reliefs, those gigantic images engraved in natural landscapes on cliffs, showing the king of kings in different contexts. Or with a certain group of silverware bearing the image of the king, an important group displaying the king and team. Some late antique Iranian image might belong to an aristocratic production, that is to say not clearly royal, silverware, fabrics, stucco decoration for houses. And finally, an important group of images displayed on seals and ceilings is an access to a more widely shared visual culture with the Sasanian society, these objects being used by almost all the levels of the society. But before seeing some of those objects, let's go back to the notion of mimesis. The notion of mimesis, in an aesthetic exception, appears first in the Poetic by Plato. The author uses this, this term to describe the ability of literary works to imitate the nature and living world. Regarding the visual culture, the notion of mimesis is also used to describe the ability of an image to render, to imitate the nature and living world. We have seen in the second video the importance of the classical aesthetic narratives in the practice of ancient art history. Well, based on that, I would say that the aesthetic exception of mimesis is also deeply linked to these classical aesthetic narratives. 
and can lead to overlooking the ability of late antique Iranian images to imitate nature, because their mimesis is not expressed by the formal ways of the aesthetic acceptation of mimesis. Towards the mystical likeness. So what are and how were built the formal ways of the aesthetic mimesis? We find some of these formal ways already in Pliny the Elder, although Pliny never used the word mimesis, mimesis. For Pliny, the first formal element to become a rule of aesthetic mimesis is the ability of the work of art to mirror reality almost as a trump line. The second element is a work's individualizing capacity, i.e. its ability to distinguish one human being from another. How do we achieve this human distinction, this individualization according to Pliny? through the meticulous rendering of air, wrinkles, muscles, and veins, but also through the ability to render feelings, those entering into an intimate level of individualization. The notion of aesthetic mimesis then covers the notion of trompe in terms of rendering the world and the notion of individualization in terms of rendering the human. This acceptation of mimesis was locked into Western aesthetic narratives at the time of the Renaissance and was even doubly locked in the way the Renaissance long appeared in Western aesthetic narratives as a renewal after the dreadful Dark Ages that was the Middle Ages. The Mimesis of Late Antique Iranian Art. As seen in the second and the third video, as an art historian, it is important for me to go over the classical aesthetic narratives, as well as my own 21st century Western eye. It has already been mentioned in the second video but there are certain formal features in the images of late antique Iran that can lead me to overlook a nevertheless very present mimesis. I count two main formal features, stylization of morphological anatomical elements, such as hair and bird, but also eyes, ears and lips and the fact that the human portraits do not present individual identification and readable emotions. That is why I would like to think about the notion of mimesis of late antique Iranian art and not in late antique Iranian art. The idea here is to contextualize an aesthetic notion to define an articulate aesthetic context with its own rules. The stylization and the living. In late antique Iranian images, the stylization of morphological anatomical elements can induce a distance with reality. And as a consequence, I cannot see the liveliness of an image. For example, in that Sassanian silver place, the lion's maid, the lion's mane, are made of very um, precise geometrical curves and well arranged strand of her. And it can give me the feeling of an animal that does not belong to reality. But there are, in fact, also elements of realism, of likeliness in those very same lions. Here, the brush of hairs at the tip of the tail, the ventral bulge, the ventral bulge as a characteristic of an Asian lion 
and there is also deep liveliness in these lions. Look at the way the bottom lion is completely stretched, how his head is turned and fold up, falls down, with his mouth widely open, suggesting his moment of death. And if we look more widely at this image, there is liveliness, movement here. Look at the position of the second lion on the right. On his back legs, his forelegs is extending as if he were trying to keep his balance while he is falling on his back. Look also at the position of the horse, his legs widely extended in the posture of the flying gallop. A way to render the horse galloping when we did not have yet the technical capacity for understanding how a horse is galloping in a morphological way. A flying gallop that gives a vivid impression of speed and strength. Even in more calm and standing images, there is liveliness. More movement if I take the time to look closer. In the rock relief, the king and the god are marching towards each other and the construction of the image with all the straight lines, both horizontal and vertical, can make me perceive statism. But if a dimension of straightness is clearly rendered by the use of geometrical construction, it does not present, prevent presence of movement. The cloak of both the king and the god is widely wide up. There is also that horse decoration. The ball which is hanging from the saddle and indicates by a slight movement backward that the horses are marching toward each other and are indeed not static. The individual emotion and the likeliness. The second formal element that can prevent me from seeing my myths in the images from latent in Kiran are the fact that human portraits do not present individual identification and readable emotion. Let's go back to that rock relief. Here, the king and the god are distinguished by a certain number of formal elements. The shape of the bird, of the hairdress also, elements of clothing, but their facial features are the same. There are no wrinkles, no mark, no scars, no particular shape of the nose or front. It is a formal feature of late antique Iranian art that has led my students in France to understand this image as a represent, uh, representation of the idea of royalty, but not as a representation as an individual king. I can understand where that understanding comes from, but I think it is a little misleading. I think that what we have here it's a different aesthetic context that does not express human individualization the same formal way we are used to in the classical aesthetic narrative. Plus, it is true that both the king and the god presents a very impassable faith with no readable emotion. That impassibility in the human's features is also visible in that silver plate, giving an impression of distance, almost of unreality. The king is in a quite dangerous situation, but nothing of his individual understanding of the situation appears. Neither fear or bravery or joy. But indeed, there are emotions in the images of late antique Iran. Their vehicle is not the human body, but the non-human body. Let's look closely at these two silver plates. The only human does not display any kind of emotion, giving us no clues about what he feels 
in such a dangerous situation. But if we look closer to the non-human, we see all the muscles contracted and the skin pleated. For the phyllids, the fascial muscles are engaged in that way when they groan, mouth wide open and teeth visible to express fear, anger and suffering. On that particular point, I would like to quote a very useful and inspiring work by Margot Sprit, an art historian, and Claude Gantar, a very veterinary doctor on the fascial expressions of the Assyrian lions. They have shown how fruitful can be an interdisciplinary approach when it comes to look closer at the images. So, in those late antique Iranian images, the emotion is given through the non-human figuration, in a very accurate and realistic zoological portrait. There is then a stylization that does not prevent likeliness, and a human impassibility that does not prevent a strong non-human emotion. The notion of mimesis in the aesthetic aesthetic context of late antique Iran is a complex imitation game around inclusion, detachment of and exclusion of real, all at once in a single image.